Atheist Nomads, episode 105. Interview with Dr. Zachary Moore, part one. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash atheist nomads. As a concerned parent of the uh, free thought community, I want to advise uh, atheist nomad listeners that this is an adult show. There will be things discussed, talked about, topics that may be inappropriate for children under the age of 25, 40. 26, 27, yeah. 40. <laughs> We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. This is episode number 105. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Dustin, how you doing, man? Doing good. And you? You know, not too fucking bad. <laughs> All right. And we are joined by Zachary Moore. He holds a PhD in molecular biology. He was the host of the Apologia and Evolution 101 podcast, the executive director and a founder of the uh, Fellowship of Free Thought in Dallas, coordinator of the Dallas Fort Worth Coalition of Reason, treasurer of Camp Quest, Texas, and is on the board of the Foundation Beyond Belief. And I am sure I am missing quite a few things. Holy uh, shit. Dr. <laughs> Zach, welcome to Atheist Nomads. Thank you, guys. It's a pleasure to be here. And it and is a just just so everybody knows, Dustin's gonna fanboy a little bit. Just yes, yes. deal with it. <laughs> Dr. Zach, it is a, a real pleasure to, to have you uh with us. Uh Apologia and Evolution 101 were two of the first four podcasts I subscribed to. I appreciate that very much. Evolution 101 in particular. There was a lot of gaps in my my education as far as as well evolution went. I, I went through the Adventist educational system. My first official uh, taste of what evolution was was a creationist propaganda class in the Seventh Day Adventist Theological Seminary called Issues and Origins. And that convinced me of evolution based on them trying to tear down like a 1970s version of evolutionary theory. Wow. And I listened to your podcast and was like, holy crap, all that stuff they're arguing about, it doesn't even matter. Right. It's all genes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, to a, to a large degree, you know, one of the main reasons why I wanted to do that um, is to get up to the the molecular evidences, which I thought was really profound and interesting, especially given my background. Um, so yeah, I was was really pleased to be able to do that. Yeah, I, I know I had to listen to most of those episodes two three times to actually understand them. <laughs> but man, uh, it, it truly and honestly changed my life. Wow! Damn. Well, hopefully for the better. Hopefully for the better. Uh, oh, definitely. I have, to give, I have to give all due credit, of course, to Reggie Finley. So this goes back uh, a ways to the earliest days of, of atheists online. Uh, Reggie Finley uh, hosted a, prog a uh, program called The Infidel Guy uh, and a website of the same name. And, uh, and it was actually kind of it was either his idea or some of his listeners idea. Um, they wanted him to sort of expand his uh, repertoire. He did sort of like interviews and stuff like that, kind of similar to what you guys do. Um, but there were some people that said, you know, um, it was actually, I think, uh, Dr. Piliucci, Dr. Uh, Massimo Piliucci, who uh, was a guest on his show and was talking about evolution at one point. And they said, wouldn't it be great if we had him on as a sort of a regular feature and we'll call it Evolution 101. And uh, uh, Dr. Piliucci was approached and he just didn't have time to do it. And so I was just sort of there and I said, well, I mean, I do have a PhD in the subject, not evolution, but molecular biology, which is close enough. And I said, you know, I mean, I could do some, you know, I could do something. And really, that's kind of the story of my time in the atheist uh, community is me sort of raising my hand tentatively and saying, hey, I, I could do something there, I think. <laughs> um, then it just sort of snowballs from there. Nice. Awesome. <laughs> Uh, so let's let's back it up a bit. Uh, sure. What was your your early background like? 
Were you raised yeah. religious? I was raised religious. I think most of us were raised religious. I actually did a survey when I was coordinator of the Downs with the Coalition of Reason. I did a survey of those of us here in DFW, and 80% of us were raised religious. And I'm I'm guessing that that's probably uh, fairly consistent across the country. Um, the ones that actually get involved, I would say so, mostly because yeah. they just don't have that. The ones that never were in church just don't really see the need for a group. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sad, what? but... They don't see what it can look like. They don't see, you know, what the, they're not familiar with what the benefits could be, you know, if you are a part of an, an organization or a community like that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it's, 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 it's interesting. I'm actually the, the last person that I think anyone would ever think would end up in the situation I'm in now where I'm not only am I an atheist, um, I'm an active out atheist and I'm, I'm sort of a local leader, uh, I do some stuff nationally um, as well. I'm. I also do. Uh, I do a lot of stuff. Actually, I'm. I'm kind of a local minister or pastor or, or whatever you want to call. It. I marry people and I do memorial services and I'm sort of often the public face. I meet with politicians. Um, all the sort. All the sorts of things that you know, sort of pastors or lay pastors or ministers might do. Uh, I do from a humanist perspective, um, which is kind of interesting. I never really thought when I was a Christian, I never thought that I would ever go into any sort of, you know, ministry or lay ministry or anything like that within the church. It was actually, I mean, church was interesting, but it was, it wasn't anything that I thought was, uh, was worth further study. And and I, what I mean that to say is I, I felt like all the questions were answered, right? So I, you know, obviously we had the Bible and, and my, my father and all these other you know, pastors that were in my life. And I got all these great works of theology from people like, um, you know, Frank Schaefer, uh, J.I. Packer. And I, you know, I, I read them and I'm like, well, given all these assumptions that I have, this all makes sense. It all hangs together. You know, it's all pretty settled, you know? So it was, it was interesting in the, in the sense that, okay, well, we have to learn how it works. But once we get to that point, it's like, well, okay, well, everything's pretty much been figured out. And, and it was, it's interesting enough. It was only after becoming an atheist, sort of apostatizing from Christianity that I, I have a much more robust, I think, appreciation for Christianity um, and, and other Christians, you know, for a long time, I, I wasn't angry. You know, I, I was never really, disenchanted with the church i was never you know pissed off nobody you know no priest ever touched me uh, or anything like that i was just kind of disappointed um i i eventually learned enough about the bible to recognize it as way more human than divine way more so than i'd ever uh, appreciated it before and i thought well, if i found this book given all the stuff that i've learned about you know um you know, comparative literature and higher criticism and textual criticism and all that kind of stuff. I said, if, if I had, if I just, you know, came across this book and I read it, would it occur to me that this has to be from the all knowing, all powerful creator of the universe, the capital G God? And as right. soon as I asked myself that question, I knew the answer was no. It was like, it was lightning fast. I'm like, oh shit. That, that of course I wouldn't. And that was the realization that really turned my life in a, in a different direction. I, I, I didn't become an atheist sort of right away. It, it took a lot of time. Look, took a lot of introspection. I, I had to sort of figure out, you know, what was I? Um, I, I, for a long time, I still wanted to call myself a Christian because this was how I had been raised. And, um, I, you know, I had all these, values and all these things were still important to me um, for the most part. And, you know, Jesus and the character of Jesus. And I thought, you know, I've, I spent so much of my life modeling myself on this character. There, there's got to be something there. Um, and so I did whatever I could to try to maintain Christianity. But the more I tried to keep in my life, the more kept slipping away. Yeah. But um, how old and, were you when this was going on? Oh, I was about uh, 22, 23. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So it was, but but at the same time, it, it 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 was it was actually kind of exhilarating. It was kind of interesting. Like I said, it it um it made me look at the Bible in kind of a different way and start to appreciate it more. And it actually became a really fascinating book. The more the more human it became, the more fascinating it was. If it's if it's strictly divine, then it's just kind of this 
cipher basically it's this um you know it's this this tool that you open up and you try to f- figure out and interpret it and do all the the exegetical um you know catapulting and handstanding in order to make sense of it all right like theologians do um but you're sort of restrained in, in how you do that and, you know that kind of depends on what theological background you might have of course but if you if you're coming at it as just a person or a humanist or whatever then it's 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 not just this sealed document it's not just sort of set off to its side it is part of this huge mosaic of human literature and everything interconnects with everything else and it becomes in my opinion a much more fascinating much more relevant document um if you don't look at it as a christian oh definitely man the the moment that you <clears throat> look at it as divine i mean then nothing is nothing in my opinion should be open for interpretation i mean it's right so there it, it's cut and dry what do you do like so let's say it let's say it is divine let's say you you do take that hypothetically you say well okay this is yeah. from all right well there's still words on a page yep. you know they're they're still they've been translated they're they're copies of copies and copies you go right to bart ehrman's argument right so he talks about the fact that the earliest copies are actually the least um uh the least faithful mm-hmm. <laughs> and People and the people we know who are making the first copies are the ones least qualified to do so. So, yeah. you know, if this is if this is divine, you know, in, in some way, how how do we make any sense of that? And that that's that's when you start adding in all these other weird theologies, like you know, well, God has protected this particular translation, and and you know, you get some people like the KJV only. That's um, right. People and they're they're I mean we can make fun of them, sure, but they that is a legitimate thing that they are responding to. They're not just being arbitrary i mean they are being arbitrary but they're being arbitrary for a very good reason because they recognize that there is an issue there if they're taking the bible to be literal and divine they have to uh, protect it in some way and i totally understand that oh yeah you Seriously. look at the some of the modern translations the more recent ones the more critical ones there's entire passages chapters even that are moved to footnotes Oh, yeah. I uh, have debates from time to time, and uh, one of the things I like to do is um, I always invite all the Christian um, members in the audience to turn their uh, Bibles to the end of Mark. (laughs) If if you have, uh, if your Bible is a good one, there's a note there that tells you that this last chapter of Mark was not there in the original, and it has been added to, to the gospel. And most people know that I, you know, I learned that when I was a kid, I, you know, I spent a lot of time reading all the notes like a good Christian nerd. Um, but most people, you say that to them and you can see their eyes like really pop because they're like, wait a minute, there's something in my Bible that was added after it was formed. Are you kidding me? Uh, yeah. You know, and, mm-hmm. and so just pointing stuff out like that to them, I don't even really care about getting them all the way on my side. I just want to sort of pop this little paradigm that so many Christians have that the Bible is this hermetically sealed, perfect thing. Um, as long as you can sort of pop that, then that's, that's the kind of Christian I want to talk to. I don't really care if they're a Christian. In fact, those are the, I wish we had more of those Christians. And that's, that's a big part of what it is that I'm, that I'm up to now, generally speaking, is trying to get more of those Christians, um, out there in the wild. Just expose ex- Excuse me. Just exposing a chink in their armor is a big thing right there. Yeah. And and not even, you know, with the goal of, of deconverting them. No. Right. You know, I just make I, them question. Yeah. 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 I, there've been a few times um, where people have come to me a few times, you know, especially citing um, evolution 101. Well, they'll send me an email years after the fact and they say, yeah, you know, I was a, uh, Bible believing, devout, fundamentalist Christian, and I came across your podcast, or I came across your blog, or whatever, and now I'm an atheist. And you know, that's the type of thing that I can imagine, like somebody like Richard Dawkins, maybe reading that and thinking, "Hooray!" You know, another one for our team. But I read that, <laughs> and, and I'll be honest, that it kind of scares me a bit. Um, and that's not to say that I think it's a bad thing that people are becoming atheists. It's just I don't know that I want the responsibility for that. I I I don't mind it so much if if my sort of con- contribution to that is just sort of one part of, among many, which I think it probably is. Um, I think people are probably just you know maybe kissing my ass a little bit, um, you know, 
like people are to do. Um, You have to be questioning for evidence to actually matter. If you're a fundamentalist, it's not going to. We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com. Tweet us at atheistnomads. Send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads. Or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. I don't want more atheist fundamentalists. I don't, I, if I, if I, if you're going to become an atheist, that's fine. I would like it to be for very good reasons. Um, I would like, you know, more people to go through a process like what I went through. Um, I'm not, not saying that the way I did is the only way you can do it, but um, I, I'm, I'm very hesitant about sort of knee jerk atheists. I, I, you know, there are more and more people that are sort of becoming part of this, this nun demographic. And um, I think that's largely a good thing, but you know, I've met plenty of atheists that are atheists for very bad reasons. And and I can imagine that there's lots of the nuns that are out there. So I guess, you know, broader than just making, you know, Christians who are critical thinkers, I'd like more everybody who is a critical thinker out in the wild. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing to keep in mind with these, these people that are, are, you know, telling you stories like that is they might be leaving out the six months or two years that they spent as a deist or liberal Christian before finally making that step to a, being an atheist exactly exactly yeah and i've met uh i've met several of those as well um there's a guy that i know um locally actually here in fort worth who i first met as a um as a christian and he was at the time he was kind of a liberal ish christian very nice very sincere um and now he is a he's pretty much an atheist now he still attends a, a unitarian church uh, but he has, and I admire what he's done. He, he really tried, he created this whole tool. So it was basically like all these different, um, balance beams. It was actually like a physical thing where he was trying to weigh, like literally weigh the evidence where he would get speeds and he would have all these little balance beams and he would say, well, this is the scientific evidence. So I'm going to give this weight to the God side and this weight to the no side. And, and he went through all these things and, he really tried to be kind of analytical about it and he kept on as his opinions would change, he would change the weight and eventually the, the scales tipped on one side and he said, all right, I think I'm ready to say, and I'm like, you know, I don't think most people do that, but that is <laughs> damn admirable for him to really, you know, plug all that stuff in and, and, uh, and do it in a very analytical way. I thought that was, you really- know, you know, to be fair though, uh, with him saying that he likes to go to a Unitarian church, that's just him saying that he likes potlucks, <laughs> coffee and donuts. Yeah, that could that could yeah. be? Yeah, that the social be. aspect because there's not much religion over there. That's it. Depends on the Unitarian church. The, there's one in Fort Worth that is uh, most of the uh, people there are effectively atheists, and yeah. uh, and they've actually had me speak uh, several times. So they're, um, I think their pastor goes on vacation every July and, and they'll uh, send me an email and say, Hey, could you do a guest sermon? So, <laughs> so I do a guest sermon. I do two sermons uh, on Sunday morning, one for the early service and one for the regular service. And um, <laughs> it's actually a lot of fun. Yeah. The UU fellowship in Boise, they, uh, their longtime minister uh, who was vaguely Catholic, uh, finally retired and uh, they ex- uh, explicitly and very intentionally recruited an atheist minister hmm. who is a lot younger and is wanting to find ways to try to get more young atheists involved. Yeah. Well, that's that's one phenomenon that definitely has changed over the past 10 years or so. So I've been I've been sort of active for about a decade. And when I first got started, as you'd mentioned um I was involved with the Fellowship of Free Thought. I was actually the very first organization I got involved with was called the North Texas Church of Free Thought, and uh, and it's a, this is actually the fault of a Christian apologist that I got involved with them. Hmm. Uh, so this this guy's name's uh, Kevin Harris, and he's actually the podcast producer for William Lane Craig. Believe oh, it or not. goodness! Mm-hmm. Um, if you've ever listened to, to Bill Craig's podcast before, you've heard Kevin. Uh, talk he's got this really silky smooth radio voice uh he's been 
radio for years and years. He's a total pro. He sounds even better, I might say, than Seth Andrews, I think. Um, yeah. But at, at any rate, he, uh, he was, uh, used to be local to Downs Fort Worth, and he organized a, an apologetics, basically themed Sunday school uh, at his church. And I had just recently moved to Dallas, and I was browsing one of the atheist message boards, and I saw somebody post, hey, guess what? This church, this Baptist church in Colleyville has invited a group of atheists to come give a presentation. And I thought to myself, that is amazing. <laughs> I'd never done anything with the atheist community. I the only the only interactions I'd ever had were online. Um I'd never I don't think I'd ever met an atheist in person before. But I saw this posted and I thought to myself, okay, an atheist presentation at a Southern Baptist church, this I have to go to. And so Sunday morning came and I drove over to church. I hadn't been to church probably in two years. So I was I was on the tail end of my apostasy and I'd stopped going to church altogether. But it's like, well, I'll go back for this. And um, it was basically a straight up interview. So Kevin interviewed the, the people from the Church of Free Thought and uh, asked some questions. And there were people in the audience that asked some questions. And it was very polite and very great. And I thought, this is, I want to be a part of this. Whatever this is, I want I, I want to know these people. I want to get involved with these people. And so I introduced myself to the Church of Free Thought. I also introduced myself to Kevin, and I became a regular attendee at his class. I, I think I was the only atheist there. Um, I was there for about two years. Hmm. Wow. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And then when the atheists got together, I'd hang out with them. So for me, it was perfect. It was the best of both worlds. I got to hang out with the Christians and then I got to hang out with the atheists. It was fantastic. Um, and then the same thing happened with the, uh, with the church of free thought. There was, um, there's kind of a transition of leadership that was happening and somebody approached me and said, you know, we need somebody to help organize these events, these meetings and things that we're doing. Um, what do you think? Uh, and I just sort of tenderly raised my hand. And I said, well, I think I can do it. And uh, one thing led to another. And eventually I was executive director of that organization. Um, and then that eventually led to uh, founding a slightly different group in Dallas, which was the Fellowship of Free Thought. Um, so that led to my sort of adventures in grassroots organizing. <laughs> so I was, uh, ED of, of both of those groups for about four or five years, um, uh, between the two of them. And then, uh, when the coalition of reason thing started happening, it was really a fantastic thing. Um, Fred Edwards came to town and he basically got everyone, all the different local groups together, uh, for a dinner. And, there had been, I think, historically, there had been a lot of um, sort of animosity or, or mistrust, perhaps, between the different groups, because everyone sort of had their own different niche carved out. So there were the skeptics, and then there are the humanists, and then the atheists, and the free thinkers, and the, um, and the brights. And they all sort of had their own claim to whatever, their own claim to legitimacy, and, you know, they wanted their own... Um, exclusivity i guess and i came into that environment and i wasn't the only one who did this but i came into this environment kind of naive and thinking well this is great so here we all we're all t here together we're all basically atheists we should totally be doing stuff together and i just i was with the free thinkers group and i went over and visited the atheist group and they were like what the hell are you doing here and i'm like oh, i'm just here to say hi and uh, after giving me the side eye for about five minutes they said oh he might be all right and then you know sort of what other and and then the the core happened and then everybody started working together and that was fantastic and we did a lot of really cool stuff here in Dallas for Worth for a while it's kind of quieted down now because we've I mean there's only so much you can do to keep the media market satisfied right so uh -huh. you do one story about oh hey we're atheists and then the news is all over it you try that again the next year and they're like wait a minute we did that story last year you know what's what's new what's different what's changed. Um, and so we're kind of victims of our own success because we've had such um, great media coverage over the past you know, five or six years or so. We actually got uh, on the New York Times. Uh, we got nice. in Le Mans and uh, some Polish language uh, Catholic newspaper as well, I think. Wow. Back in back in 2010, we uh, we caused a bit of a stir. We um, 
we we decided to take out advertisements instead of taking out a billboard. We want to take out advertisements on the bus system in Fort Worth. And uh, the reason we chose Fort Worth is because we tried contacting Dallas and Dallas got wise and they preemptively changed their policy to disallow any religious advertising on their buses. So Dallas was out. <laughs> But Fort Worth uh, had not done that yet. So we got the paperwork in and got our ads on. And almost immediately there was a protest from predominantly black pastors in Fort Worth. And they got together. They, they organized with the Southern Christian Leadership Committee. That's, you know, Dr. King's organization and a coalition, a local coalition of black pastors got together and petitioned the, the bus system to disallow us uh, to run that ad. And then to, to take it off or they would uh, organize a boycott of the bus system. And this floored us. Right. We were not expecting this. You know, we were expecting, you know, sort of general Christian antipathy, you know, to who we are and what we were doing. Sure. Uh, but what was interesting, I thought, was you know, there was a news story in the Fort Worth newspaper and they interviewed several pastors and they interviewed uh a Methodist pastor, and he said, "Oh yeah, you know those atheists. You know, ha ha ha. They're 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 always up to something." I say, "You know, it's we got free speech. Let them do what they want. It's no skin off my nose." And then another pastor, I think, disciples of Christ, perhaps, said basically the same thing. And then the this other these black pastors were saying the exact opposite. I thought, "This what is going on here? There's there's something weird." And so I, I actually I contacted the pastor who was quoted. Um, by the newspaper article and I called him up <laughs> and I said, hi, uh, I'm with the coalition of reason. And we're the group that has the advertisement that you're about to boycott. Uh, I'm wondering if I could talk with you. And so we set up uh, an appointment for me to meet him at his, uh, at his church office. And I just sort of waltzed over there. Basically I wasn't thinking too much of it. I thought it was just going to be, you know, I've been sit down and learn a little bit more from him. What, what exactly he was going through. I went into his office and it was, turns out it was me and him and four other black pastors, each of one, each of them as big as me and with a real mean, angry look on their face. Like they were really pissed off. And, I, and then there's just me and I'm a pretty big guy, but man, I was intimidated. So I sat down and I'm in the middle of the circle, all these, you know, pissed off black pastors looking at me, giving me the stink eye. And I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> What did we do? <laughs> and anyway, long story short, it turns out that we had not considered this at all. Uh, it just had not occurred to us because, you know, we're just a bunch of white guys, basically. But um, the bus system predominantly serves uh, those communities that can't afford, um, you know, their own transportation. So primarily the, the poor communities and, and primarily uh, the poor communities tend to be more demographically black. And so they felt that because we were specifically putting our advertisements on the bus system, we were specifically targeting black people. And that opened up this whole big can of worms, whole big can of worms, because here we were, all these white atheists trying to come into their community and effectively, as they saw it, strip away the only thing that was good in their lives, the only thing that that provided stability and, you know, uh, resources and, and, and help people get by is the church. And, and there's a very good point to that, right? So as I was walking into his office, I saw all these sort of brochures and all these signs out uh, for people as they're coming in. There were signs about, you know, you know financial um, preparedness and helping people bounce their checkbooks. There were signs about, um, you know, free child care and the, I think they had a food pantry and all these things that help these people who are struggling uh, get by. And here we are coming along saying, oh, hi, we're a bunch of white guys and we want to take all this away from you. And and all of a sudden it made sense. And I was talking with uh, my good friend, Alex Jules, who's also local here. And I said, these black pastors are super pissed at me, man. And he said, yeah, you better believe they are because <laughs> you're coming in and and stripping away uh, the thing that they value most in their lives, uh, much more so than any of these other any of the white people in, in Fort Worth. You know, they didn't care. They weren't threatened by it. But it was because of who we were and the way that we did it. It was it was just a very bad thing. So that that was sort of the, the first major lesson I learned about 
sort of how the atheist movement can learn a few lessons about race relations. And that was back in 2010. So we still have a lot to learn about it, but we're, we're getting a little bit better. If you like the show, consider giving us some financial support. We make it really easy with one-time donations or to support us on a per episode, monthly, or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at atheistnomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. One dollar an episode is all we ask. Please think of the kittens. But you at least got media attention. When we launched the uh, Treasure Valley Coalition of Reason in Boise, we put up two billboards, one on the uh, on I-184 and one right in, in Nampa, right by Northwest Nazarene University. One TV channel covered it. The statesman, yeah. the local newspaper covered it. Yeah. Nobody cared. It's yeah, it's it's old news, and in in, in part that's a good thing. Um, you know, to a certain extent, also it's the the reality is the media doesn't care unless there's a conflict, right? So you've if you're going to bring them a story, you have to bring them conflict. Uh, so you have to either know um, some pe- preacher that's going to get pissed off, like for example. Um, when my friend Alex, he was part of the African Americans for Humanist campaign and he had a billboard up in South Dallas. And we knew when we contacted the media, we told them exactly which pastors that they should call for their pull quotes. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> and, and they got exactly what they wanted and, and it became, you know, a little media circus for uh, about a week or so. Um, but that's, that's what the media wants. Unfortunately, that's just sort of the way it works. I don't know any other way of, of getting it out there other than that. But on the other hand, it's, it's also kind of good things like, well, atheists are here. That's old news. Nobody cares. That's exactly what we wanted. Mm-hmm, you know, that's yeah. exactly what yeah. we were going for. That's actually, I mean, you think about this and it's kind of bizarre to me. Uh, in 2015, it's actually kind of boring to say that you're an atheist in public, right? Yeah. It's kind of, you know, n- you're not going to get any sort of, reaction from people i mean maybe from your your family perhaps perhaps but that's probably even going away too um but just in in general if you mention that in public i mean people aren't going to bat an eyebrow in 2015 and i i think about 20 2005 and how crazy that was at the time and you know 1995 oh my god i can't even imagine Mm -hmm. no so in 20 short years how far we've come where being an atheist is no big deal anymore oh my god uh, you know, a really great I, example on that. In 2005, uh, Idaho Atheists got the Idaho State Capitol steps for National Day of Reason and had to sue to keep their, their reservation. Wow. 2015, the president of Idaho Atheists got the reservation, Treasure Valley Coalition of Reason, did National Day of Reason, and nobody cared. Not even the people that had to go to the Capitol Rotunda. They came up to the podium... Uh, is this the the prayer group? No, yeah. no, go inside. Oh, okay, nobody cares. <laughs> I I gotta be honest though. You know, I work in a navy base up here in Washington State, and in 2005, uh, you know, I was having a private conversation with a coworker in in our lunchroom, and another coworker heard what we were talking about, uh, maybe an atheist, and he walked to his locker and threw a Bible at me and said, "You need to read this," but you know. Still, I work with a whole bunch of ex Navy chiefs, and yeah, uh, yeah, they're still definitely not too happy about it and talk shit to me occasionally on it. It's funny, the military, um, that's that's kind of one of the last great frontiers. Um, but there are there are tremendous pockets of, of sort of free thought and, and atheism. Uh, so here in, in Texas, I, I help out with Camp Quest, Texas, and uh. One of our organizers uh, for several years was based out of San Antonio, and her husband was um, was working with the military. And there's a whole bunch of military people that they knew there. It's a big military town, and uh, and they got all this money together, and they bought us a suite of microscopes for camp. Um, mm. And I was just blown away. I thought, you know, well, I know there's a few atheists in the military, but there, I mean, they're enough to buy us a suite of microscopes to set up at camp. And that that just blew me away. And uh, and then there's the stuff that Mikey Weinstein is doing, Jason Torpier doing, and they're making strides. They're making positive strides. Um, it's fantastic. It's slow, but it's happening. It's slow, but it's happening. Yeah, exactly. Like the Boy Scouts. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, and oh, those we- silly Boy Scouts. What's weird with the military is is typically they've been on the forefront of social change. Like desegregation of the military was decades before it happened to the rest of the country. That's true. But yeah. it was also kind of forced on them. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's I don't I don't know. I don't know enough about military culture. I, I my cousin uh was in the army for several years and he um he was a bi or is a bisexual atheist and liberal, incredibly liberal. And he joined the army and at the time was saying something about, you know, I'm going to go in there and I'm just going to I'm going to make it better. I'm going to change things. I'm going to show them the way it should be done and all this stuff and yeah. Uh, now he sings a bit of a different tune. But, um, you know, because the the army, you know, the army is a juggernaut. The army, the army changes for no man. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but and, it, it's fascinating. And effectively, I'm sorry, but and effectively, neither does the Boy Scouts because they only let it be the, the local troops de- decision whether they, they allow uh, well, that's, gay, gay troop leaders. That's and I and I hate to put it this way, but that's that's brilliant. I mean, it's it's really a a brilliant piece of politics that they've done, uh, and it's it's it was started b- back in um, was it twenty thirteen when they allowed um, mm-hmm. gay scouts? Yeah, yeah. When they did that, I I knew and I I told people at the time I said, all right, it's it's they've they've set a clock that is ticking down, and and this clock will tick down, and we will have gay leaders everywhere. It's just a matter of time because once you have gay scouts everywhere, you're going to have uh, at some point, at some point in the near future, a critical mass of gay former scouts, you know, Eagle Scouts, whatever, who want to now serve. And you, you're, you're eventually going to have them. And what, what they've done now is they've said, well, look, the local groups can sort of establish this thing, which basically means the Mormons, right? So the Mormons are the ones that are really pissed off about this. And so if you're a Mormon group, you're probably full of Mormon kids. They're probably, you know, repressing in the closet anyway. So they're not going to speak up. Um, so they, they bought themselves a little bit of time there, I think, but there's going to be a critical mass of enough of these gay former scouts who want to serve and their local groups might say no. Uh, and then they 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 will sue and they will have cause to sue and they will have the weight of public uh, support behind them and then the the BSA will have to open up to everybody. It's just a matter of time. It's definitely a matter of time, and I'm very glad for that. But like you're saying, the Mormons and the Catholics pretty much sew up most of the BSA. So you know, I I don't, from the way I hear <laughs> the troop leader who is in my office who is a a Mormon himself. They don't want a fucking thing to do with that. Right, right, right. Yeah, where I see being the what I see as being the driving force to really push the issue once and for all is going to be the military, because uh, Eagle Scouts get uh, advanced rank when they enlist in the military. Right. Uh, e, start out E three, and they also get uh, preferential treatment for application to service academies. And now that the military, oh, it's not. Don't, don't ask, don't tell isn't around anymore. Gays are allowed to openly serve. It's not going to be long before either the military or Congress decides that, yeah, the Boy Scouts don't get those for those privileges if they're going to be discriminating. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. It's just, it's a ma- matter of time. What they did, and the reason why I say it's brilliant is because if they had gone all the way uh, and said that every troop has to allow gay volunteers and leaders, um, then they might flush the Mormons out. And mm-hmm. uh, possibly Catholics as well, and then the BSA would collapse. So yeah. this is the only way for them um, to make it work. So the BSA is still around, um, and then they're counting on the the fact that the the Mormons are going to be the least impacted by this, and that at, by the time um, they finally do have to extend that to everyone, the Mormons will sort of feel the pressure of the of the culture, and they'll go along with it. So. Oh, the Mormons are already feeling the pressure of the culture. They yeah. ended up actually pushing through the uh, non-discrimination law in, in Utah. I would tell you it's fascinating. Um, so we've had at the Fellowship of Free Thought in Dallas, we've had um, several Mormons, ex-Mormons, uh, as part of our membership for years. But mm-hmm. only recently there's been like something like a groundswell and all these ex-Mormons or foremans or whatever you want to call them 
they're all coming out of the woodwork and so, something is is happening with the Mormon church and th- there's been some some point has been reached and uh, and people are just fed up with it. The people who would have stuck around and, and these are people who have donated and I've talked with them. They've donated tens of thousands of dollars to the church. They did everything they're supposed to do. They've got, you know, 13 kids and, oh, uh, you know, <laughs> it's crazy. Um, but they but man, when they come. It, it, it's great because when they come over to our side and they join the, the fellowship group or, or whatever, man, they're committed because they know because the Mormon church does a lot of things right. You know, it does community right. It does. It does, you know, sort of education. It does kind of common culture. Right. And they know what that looks like and what it feels like and how great it is for their family to have that. And they come into the fellowship and they want to help build that. And they have a hugely vested interest in that. And so I can't. I mean, I can't imagine a better because, you know, when we started, it was honestly, you know, it was just a group of old white guys um, just sort of cobbling this stuff to, together. But now we've got all these young people and families and uh, we're about it at um, gender parity, men and women. Um, it's actually it's, it's really fantastic the way the grassroots has, has changed, at least in Dallas Fort Worth. I have to say thank you to the Mormons for screwing up so badly that you're sending. Like, people. <laughs> it's been wonderful. Wow. You've got a very different take on on Exmos than than what I see in Boise, because uh, most of what we have here is and there's like Idaho atheists, the people who show up. I'd mm-hmm. say easily half are ex Mormon. Okay, and which makes sense being in you know Southern Idaho, uh, but pretty much every single one left the church either before their mission or right after their mission. Oh wow, that's interesting. Not while they had families. Wow! Uh, yeah, we, it, when you're in this heavily Mormon of an area at that point, yeah. uh, the church is so pervasive that all your ties are right there. If you want a job, you've got a job. Yeah. If you need help, it's there. The interview went a bit long, so I decided to go ahead and just cut it in half. So we'll be back next week with news, and then in two weeks, we'll have the conclusion of the interview. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find us online at www.atheistnomads.com. Contact us at contact at atheistnomads.com or leave us a voicemail message at 541-203-0666. You can also like us on Facebook or leave us a review on iTunes, Zoom, or wherever else you find the podcast. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads.